Hi, my name is Melissa Miku McGrath, and I'm a CPDTKA out of Boston. I'm author of the book Considerations for the City Dog. Earlier this year, I was invited to the Museum of Science to do one of the coolest presentations I've ever had the opportunity to give, and it was all about how the nose works. And the reason I was asked to give this presentation was because the Science uh, Museum had a wonderful exhibit called A Dog's Tail. Um, it was so great. You could go through the exhibit, you could see how a dog could smell, you could put your head in like um, in another dog's head and kind of look around and see what it is that a dog sees and how they see color. Um, you could also um, put your head in um, little miniature rooms to hear what it is a dog hears. And that actually kind of broke my heart because in considerations for the city dog, one of the things we talk about is the audio landscape and how that can be really stressful for a dog to live in with highway noises and people living upstairs with high heels walking. Um, but what what we didn't talk about and that I was very, uh, very much made aware of was they can also hear the electricity running through the walls or if you have a clock, they can hear that ticking. A dog can hear um, at 80 feet what we hear at 20 feet. So they're way more sensitive with their hearing. And that was something that I learned in that exhibit, um, even after training dogs for 15 years. So it was really great for professionals and for um, people just interested in dogs to go check this out. Um, and I'm really, really sad that that exhibit is no, uh, as of right now, because of COVID-19, we're coming up on the end of May. This exhibit was supposed to run until the end of May, 2020. And I don't know if they got an extension. I don't work with the museum, um, but I was invited to go and give this presentation. So what I wanted to do was try to give this to the people who missed it, um, th that missed that exhibit during the, um, because of COVID-19. And this presentation is called The Nose Nose, How Dogs see the world through their noses and how we can enrich their lives with scents. And we're also gonna go over some of the cool jobs that dogs can do. And because I'm recording this in my home, you might hear my second grader running around, you might hear some noises, you might hear some barking. It, we're all living it right now. <laughs> so let's get started. So why are dogs considered super sniffers? Well, let's start with their uh, scent receptors. We only have six million and that might seem like a lot, but if you look at how many a dog has, they have 300 million scent receptors. So yeah, you can mark, you, we know conceptually that 300 million is a lot bigger than 6 million, right? But if you were to really put that in perspective, that would be the difference between walking into a room where you can smell somebody baking cookies and actually walking into a room and picking out, that's a quarter of a teaspoon of baking soda. I can smell the chocolate chips. There are 17 in that first cookie. There's some flour. Is that nutmeg and cinnamon? Um, so they can pick out the amount and the type of ingredient in those cookies that are baking, which is pretty impressive. Um, we cannot do that. <laughs> Another reason that they're able to do that, not in, outside of this, just the sheer number of scent receptors they have, they have this little um, magic organ that humans don't have, or at least we we had it, but it is now vestigial. And vestigial is a fancy word for saying it no longer works. <laughs> like we have evolved to no longer need it. We have another vestigial organ and it's called the appendix. Um, for um, snakes, lizards, most mammals, primates, and dogs, they have what's called the Jacobson's organ. It lives back here behind their front teeth. There's a picture on this slide and it's that little bumpy thing. And um, if you've ever seen a snake like and bring in the scent and they kind of push it up through that little organ to get up into the nasal cavity and that's what dogs are doing too. You might see them when they're doing nose work or what, which is a, a sport that I'm gonna show you in a bit or if you see working dogs, they're kind of tasting the air. Um, and that's just another way that they can kind of get more information into their brain. So they use that like little shortcut between the roof of their mouth and their nasal passages. So yes, they're breathing in the air, but they're also tasting it and shoving important information up through that Jacobson's organ. It's also called the marrow nasal organ in case you wanna win pub trivia. Um, dogs can also smell in 3D. So have you ever done this as a kid? Like you cover one eye and then you cover the other and then you cover the other and then you cover the other and it looks like the world is moving. Um, dogs can also smell in 3D. So wh where they can sniff on one side and it can give them a directional as to where the odor is coming from way more efficiently than with us. Um, 
they also breathe in and out. On this slide, it says at the same time, but that's just kind of a misnomer. They're not circular breathing in the same way that we would think of maybe a trumpet player or fancy, um, maybe somebody who's doing like um, high level wind instrumentation. But what we do have is a dog, and I'm going to show you here on the next slide. Um, this is my dog, Captain, who you're gonna see doing some demonstrations a little later. And you can see where he's a little foamy on the side of his nose there. Um, that is not rabies, I promise. <laughs> but he gets very foamy around the nose and the mouth when he's been sniffing and trying to get in a lot of information for fun. So this was after a particularly good sniffing session out in the woods. Um, the woods, I live in the city. This is really just about 40 feet of grass that we have access to, but there are two highways right next to this patch of grass that you see. Um, so when he breathes in through his nose, he breathes out through that little flap on the side where all that foam is coming in. And then he can, as he's breathing out, that air kind of stays there and he can breathe it back in again if he needs to. Um, for us, I like to think of this as almost like a side exit. Um, whereas with us, we have one door. We have one way in and one way out, just entrance and exit in the same door. They have an entrance and an exit. Um, that makes it easier for them to be able to identify and maintain that scent that they might be trying to track or trying to follow or trying to get more information about. They can also smell up to 40 feet below the ground. Now think of a basketball net. A basketball net is about uh, 10 feet high, standard basketball net. If it's my basketball net, it's about four feet off the ground. Um, but a basketball net is about 10 feet off the ground. If you can imagine four of them stacked on top of each other, buried underneath your feet, your dog can smell that far down, which is pretty impressive. So if you think about um, spring and fall, where your dog might be more interested in trying to pick up odors, it might be because they can hear all the little animals going to ground for fall and getting ready for hibernation and insects crawling. And in the spring, as they're waking up and they're starting to move and they might start to eat and make more noise, your dog can not only hear it, they can smell it too. And that's really wild if you think about it. So when your dog is just walking through the neighborhood and they're smelling, they're not just smelling the grass, they're smelling four basketball nets underneath its feet. So what can we use these dogs for now that we know that they're basically, they have this superpower that we don't have. Um, they're basically Superman with the x-ray vision, but with their nose. So what can we use that for to our benefit? Well, we can use them for explosive detection work. Um, bomb detection dogs are often trained on up to 17,000 odors. And those odors um, include chemicals and plastics, fuses, um, and that number, that 17,000 number, increases every year as explosive makers get more and more creative. So these dogs, the explosive detection dogs, unlike maybe the police dogs that you might have seen on TV or if you have um, if you've had a police officer come to your classroom or um, if you've ever had somebody like that in your life who's been able to talk a little bit um, from experience about handling canine officer dogs, um, those dogs are often cross-trained, meaning that they get to do two or three different things. Whereas bomb detection dogs, because they need to have their brain Rolodex totally dedicated to just bomb detection work, um, they are not cross-trained. They also give what's called a passive alert. And a passive alert is what this dog on this slide is doing right now. He is giving a beautiful sit um, next to the container that I assume as a trainer looking at this has the um, odor that he's looking for that indicates that this is bomb making material. Um, now it's important to realize that a lot of bomb making material might also be material that we see in the outside world. So like my kids, My Little Pony has a very specific plastic and that might also be used to create a fuse for a bomb. Um, so the dog also has to be able to tell the chemical weight um, and that plastic might be heavier and might kind of rise to the fore and the dog's like, wait, I smell that plastic, but I also need to smell the chemical inside. And if that chemical is absent, that's probably a little kid's Barbie and they can go through the airport. If not, then maybe we have a problem here. So these dogs are really smart and for obvious reasons have to give a passive alert unlike this dog who's going to give an active alert very likely if he's doing narcotics detection if he finds drugs he's going to probably dig paw bite at the source of that um that that narcotic 
Um, they also might be trained to get the bad guy and they're not following somebody who's bad. They don't know that you're bad, but what they are following is adrenaline. So if you are running from the police or if you are running away from the scene of a crime, you are blowing adrenaline. That is a hormone in our body. We all have experienced it. If For me, if a spider were to dangle right here, you would see the adrenaline response firsthand. And my dog would be able to smell it. Um, and so what they're doing is they're chasing that adrenaline response. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about it, there are some really great shows and resources out there for you. Um, I liked the show Canine. Um, uh, it, was, it was on Animal Planet a few years ago. It was about these canine detectives um, in Minnesota, St. Paul. And it was just, I just loved watching that show. I, I'm the daughter of a cop. Um, I got into working with dogs because I fell in love with canine um, work and realized I am not suited for canine work. <laughs> and I much rather um, leave that to the people who are qualified and good at their jobs. Well, I'll continue working with pet dogs and teach people. That's something that I love to do. I love to teach. Um, but yeah, so like watching these police dogs when I was a kid and learning all about the work that they do, it's impressive. Um, but they are more active in their alert. They're very likely not going to sit down. Unless you have somebody um, handling a dog in an airport, you're not going to see those active. Um, you're going to see these dogs more the passive sits or downs or whatever that they're looking for. Um, so what other jobs can these dogs do? Well, this is one of my favorites right in our backyard here in Boston, Riley the Museum Dog. Um, and if you haven't checked it out, there's a wonderful book out there called Ry The Adventures of Riley the Museum Dog, illustrated by my good, good friend, Ryan Huddle. Um, it is a wonderful story about this little dog, Riley, who really does work at the Museum of Science, uh, uh, sorry, the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, Riley detects pests that might eat the art. Um, so she's trained on, I believe, termites and moths. I have to double check. Um, but she, oh, sorry, Riley, goes around and is able to find pests and, and is a volunteer for the MFA. So you might see Riley working, working around the MFA and in Boston. Um, there's also Tucker and Jack. They're whale poop detectives. Who knew? Um, so this is under the umbrella of conservation canines. And what conservation canines do is they can go um, with the wildfires in Australia last year. We had um, some of the conservation canines were trained to go out and look for uh, endangered species, um, endangered trees, endangered plants, koalas, injured animals, things like that. So these conservation canines had already been trained to locate these things, but they were in desperate need um, during the wildfires of uh, 2019. Um, and they're used also in this case with whale poop. Let's not bury the lead or the slide. Um, these two dogs um, could smell um, whale poop. And the reason these dogs were trained to look for orca, orca scat um, was that the orca pods were having more cases of miscarriage. If I was reading the, the article correctly, they were having more incidences of, um, of miscarriages in the orca pods off the coast of, off of America's West Coast in Washington state. And these dogs were trained to find the scat because like as soon as a whale poops, it sinks rather quickly. So the researchers could not find the poop that they could take the sample from and be able to learn what's going on chemically or maybe um, in the environment for these whales. Um, so they train these two dogs to find whale poop. An interesting side note, um, Tucker, the black lab there on the slide on the left, if you zoom in very carefully, you'll see that his eyes are a little bit cloudy. So he, he was a little bit older. He was 13, I believe, when he retired and Jack ended up taking over. Tucker was also aquaphobic, which is not usually something that we think about when we see a black Labrador. Um, these dogs were bred to work in water. Um, but just goes to show you just because you get a specific breed of dog doesn't necessarily mean that that dog is going to fit the exact mold of what that breed was supposed to do. Genetics are so cool. And if you're interested in canine genetics, definitely check out Eleanor Carlson's work um, and the uh, Darwin's Dog Project. Um, they can also find accelerant. So we'll often see dogs working in arson cases or suspected arson cases. Um, they can also find low blood sugar and detect if it, there's an oncoming seizure. So this is what I was telling the, um, the spectators at the Museum of Science. If you are to see a dog with a service dog vest and that person doesn't look like they're disabled, 
you don't know what's going on with that human and how hard that dog has to work to do its job to keep that owner safe. So if this is a dog that is working with a handler that might have an invisible illness like PTSD, diabetes, um, seizure issues, anything like that, those dogs might be um, working really, really hard to detect subtle changes in the way that the human smells to be able to get them to safety quickly. Um, seizure dogs will often be trained to move their handler away from a doorway, uh, away from a staircase and lay on top of them. Um, so there are different things that these dogs are trained to do. And just because somebody isn't um, visually, like that you personally can't see why they would have a service dog, that doesn't mean that they don't need a service dog. So just be very mindful of that. So please don't go up to dogs wearing vet, who are wearing vets and going, woof, 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 or, oh, who's a good boy, who's a good boy, no. or can I pet that dog? Um, the owners are not being mean. Those owners have dogs that are working very hard. So if they could do easy thing, um, what we would consider maybe easy, simple, everyday tasks, like going to the post office, going to the Museum of Science. We saw several service dogs at the Museum of Science and it made my heart sing. Um, going to the grocery store. This can be a big ask for a lot of these people and for their dogs, they're working so hard to keep their handler safe and to ignore distractions. So make it easier for those dogs and try to, uh, to even if that dog is really cute, that dog is working really hard, so please don't be that distraction. Um, the other thing that I'd like to make a note about, um, also please don't be tempted to put a vest on your dog if they are not actively doing a job for you. Um, this can get, um, this can, there's a whole thing about it in the dog training community and in the service dog community, um, but I would beg you, as tempting as it is to put an, uh, an emotional support dog vest or a service dog vest on your dog so you can take it to the grocery store, the people who have legitimate service dogs, they can lose out on, on having access to these public spaces if an untrained dog or if somebody who doesn't have the need for a service dog is bringing these pets into these facilities. So just be mindful. Um, and if it's your pet dog, let your pet dog stay at home. And if you want to take them with you, write to your legislator, write to different businesses and see if there are ways that you can bring your dog in. Um, but leave the service dog vests on eBay and on Etsy unless you actually have to have a service dog vest to take your trained animal into a space that dog is doing a job for you. These dogs can also find termites. They can find truffles, which is a, a fancy mushroom, um, bed bugs, and they can certainly find you, as I was talking about before with this, uh, the blowing of adrenaline if you're running away. Um, dogs can pick up on so many things. Um, we're also discovering that they can detect COVID-19, and there are six dogs in the UK right now learning how to detect COVID-19 and hopefully be able to um, help in the efforts to continue to flatten this curve globally. So your dog sees the word world through smell, and it's important um, to let them sniff when they're out on walks. Um, Dazzy Todd um, from Psychology Today, she often will uh, talk about um, using a sniffari and letting your dog go out and just sniff. That is so important. It's almost the equivalent of us reading a good book. Um, it, it's often not the exercise, but checking their pee mail that's gonna get them more and more tired. So if you have a, a very frisky dog, maybe try letting them go out and sniffing things. Don't keep pulling them away from bushes or trees. Let them check it out. Let them check their pee mail. That is so important to them. Um, and you can teach them to find things with their noses. And that's something we're gonna do today. I'm gonna demonstrate a couple of easy things that you can do and give you resources to discover how you can go ahead and train your dog today to do an e an, a relatively low impact, rather easy game that we call scent work. Um, it also goes by the name nose work, and that's a trademarked term. So if you're working with a nose work instructor, that's trademark. If you're working with scent dogs, um, that is not trademarked. Um, I am not a nose work instructor, though I do work at a facility where there are. Um, so I might slip between the two, but be I'm trying to be mindful in using the right terminology. Um, so we're going to show my dog Captain here. Um, we're going to show you guys today the beginning of Find It. We're going to show you guys a game called the Box Game. And so if you've been ordering a lot of Amazon things and packages, save those boxes because we can use them um, for scent work today. Um, we're going to show you guys how to hide a treat and how to pair an odor with food so your dog can find it. Um, and I just wanted to show my friend's uh, dog 
Sammy, who came with me to the Museum of Science. Hi, Sammy. Hi, Donna. Um, Donna is a nose work instructor, and she was able to bring Sammy to the Museum of Science, and he was able to detect. He's a short little guy. He's it's about this tall off the ground, and he was able to detect odor in a tin. The tins look like this. I'm waiting for Captain to show up over here. But the tins look like this. And while you can't smell it, it's just like a little tin. It slides open and it should slide open. Of course it doesn't. <laughs> there we go. Oh, there's a lot of Q-tips in here. That's why. Let me get a different one. Um, boop, boop, there we go. So in it is a magnet and some Q-tips. And on those Q-tips, we put odor. And when these dogs are looking for um, foreign odor, when they're doing nose work or scent work, um, we are pairing that smell with food. So we would pair birch, uh, cypress, clove, or anise. Those are the four that they use, I believe, in nose work um, on those Q-tips. What I did uh, for my nose work class that we were running in quarantine by the, the week that we end up getting to the, um, to the pairing of odor with the food after they did the games I'm going to show you here in a minute, we used what we had in our cabinet. So I showed them how to use vanilla and have the dog find vanilla instead. So while they won't win any scent work competitions with vanilla, at least their dog now knows how to find it and how they can hide that Q-tip or a tin or something with that odor in it. And the dog will be able to find it. And then you treat the dog for finding the reward. It's very similar to how they train for cadaver dogs, um, for narcotics detection, for Daisy the Cancer dog, uh, for the whale poop dogs, for all of these dogs that you saw earlier in the presentation, this is how you go uh, and you start that process. And this is the sport of nose work or scent work that we're gonna be going over here. And this is something that you can do today with your dog at home. So first we're gonna teach them that find it, that there is always food to find. So I'm taking a little piece of food, I'm showing my friend Bolana, and I'm putting it on the ground and I'm saying, find it, find it. And then she goes to find it find it. And it's very easy. You want it to be stupid easy for your dog. We don't want to make this super complicated. So I'm asking her to sit and wait. She's on her bed. And now after she's figured out that this means I have something to find, I'm going to start to throw it a little further away. I'm not asking her to stay and then release her yet. I still want her to go pretty far. There we go. So in this case, I'm going to throw it on the ground if she starts to lose interest. I'm going to ask her to sit, wait, and then I'm going to start to add an easy hide. She can't see it, but she can infer where it is because she can watch where I'm going. So I want her to want to find this thing. I'm going to start to build a little drive. So I'm hiding it behind the leg of that chair of that little cot there. So she knows it's in that area. So she can still use her eyes to find it. Actually, Bolana is blind in one eye, so she can use her eye. And she did. So I gave her the cue, find it. She jumped up and looked for it. Then we're gonna add boxes. Only one of these boxes will ever have food in it and we call that the hot container. And this is what we were able to demonstrate at the Museum of Science and this is my dog, Captain. The food, if I recall, well, he'll tell us which one it's in, but there is just food in one of these boxes. If you are doing this as, a, um, as a, an activity at home, you're going to go ahead and just always have food or odor in one box, never mix up odor into all of the boxes and Captain found it. And Captain has a more active alert. You can see that he kind of chews on the box. After you practice this game for a while, you can then start to play with height. And in this case, I've got it in that last chair. Captain was hiding, so he didn't see where it went. So now he's using his nose. He skipped those first two boxes. Oh, there it is. And he's looking back at me, it's here. Once they find it at the source, and this goes back to the original box game too, where they're all on the floor, we're always feeding the dog extra food. So there's food in that box. All right, send your dog. And so here he is, he's looking for this food and he's going to tell her it's here. And work with Captain. She told him to stay. Find it. Okay. 
just in the play. Mm -hmm. You're a good handler, kiddo. And why is it there? He Do you have the other cookie to give him once he finds it? Yeah. I will not point to it. Oh, he found it, kiddo. Tell him yes. Good job. Go put him back in the box. Good job. High five, kiddo. Okay, this video is going to be very hard to see, but I have Captain here, and we are in a storage facility. We were walking behind by that dumpster from the earlier video, and we came across one of my favorite finds, an abandoned machine of some sort. So, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to tell Captain to stay. I'm going to hide a couple of cookies here. So I've got one here. So this is for nose work. You don't necessarily need to find something like this. We've done this, uh, 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 stay. And maybe I'll put one here on the wheel. You see that? Okay. Now there are two finds for him. I'm gonna take him over here, cap touch. Ready? Find it. So he's sniffing. He didn't see where I went, so I just want you to watch him work. Yes, he found it. Found the first one. I don't want him really going underneath because I don't want him to get hurt. There's also a sandwich over here. It's over there in the sh in the, sh uh, the light. I don't want him to get that. I do want him to get this cookie. Yes, good boy. And nope, leave it. Good boy. And here are some resources for you if you're interested in either nose work or how the dog's nose works. Of course, check out the Museum of Science and see if you can find a dog's tail um, depending on where they end up going next and how things are going um, with quarantine. They may or may not be able to open it up soon. I don't, if the Museum of Science in Boston is able to hold on to the exhibit, please, please, please go. It was such a good, it was such a good exhibit perfect for kids and professionals alike. Um, definitely check out Donna's Do Right Dogs if you're on the South Shore of Massachusetts for nose work and scent work classes. NEDTC.org rolls right off the tongue. That stands for New England Dog Training Club, where Donna and I are the co-training directors of the oldest AKC obedience club in the country. And there we sometimes offer nose work classes as well. Um, every Dog Training Center, if you're interested in doing scent work up on the North Shore, performance scent dogs, also um, high fidelity dogs um, in Everett, Massachusetts, the MSPCA of Nevins Farm and in Boston and all of their locations, I believe, also have nose work classes and information for you. And because we're all working online right now, you should be able to access any of these places. Just reach out to those instructors and they can start helping you get started in nose work today if you're interested. Um, then there's all, of course, the National Association of Canine Scent Work, NACSAW. They're the, the forerunners of scent work and nose work games and getting this whole sport of nose work recognized. Um, so tip of the hat to them. And if you just really need something to read, being a Dog by Alexandra Horowitz, um, just following her stuff and the, and the work that she does in New York City about noses and scent and how dogs perceive the world. It's just so incredible and definitely follow her stuff and get that book. You should be able to get it on a Kindle if you can't get to a library today. Um, and so thank you again to the Museum of Science for inviting me to go and give this presentation live and in person. And I hope to be able to do so again. I really loved performing and my dog captain really did too. Um, and again, thank you again to Donna Colbert for helping me with this presentation. Special thanks and shout out to Melissa Serrano for handling captain while I was able to talk um, for the month that we were there at the Museum of Science, um, being able to give these presentations to the public. If you enjoy this presentation, please feel free to share with your network and go and support the Museum of Science, your museums around you, um, and just, you know, thank science. And more about me, my name is Melissa McHugh-McGrath. I'm a certified professional dog trainer. 
out of Boston. I've been teaching for the last 15 years here in the city of Boston. Um, and I teach disc dogs and scent work and basic manners. I'm the co-training director of the oldest obedience club in the country, the uh, New England Dog Training Club based out of Cambridge. Um, I also wrote the book Considerations for the City Dog, and in it is a lot about nose work and how we can use nose work in the city to help high energy, anxious dogs cope um, with urban living. If you're curious about getting a dog or have questions about how to get one responsibly through a breeder or through a rescue organization, um, or if you just have questions about how to live in a city with a dog, feel free to check out Considerations for the City Dog. You can find me on Instagram, Melissa McHugh McGrath, at Mutt Stuff on Twitter. If you're on Facebook, it's the Mutt Stuff Facebook group. So Facebook group Mutt Stuff <laughs> and the Facebook page Considerations for the City Dog.